Kennedy Jr. Forum. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event with the Prime Minister of Ireland, Taoiseach Inda Kenny. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK Street side of the auditorium. In the event of an emergency, please walk. Do not run to the exit closest to you. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. If you are on Twitter tonight, join the conversation with hashtag IrishPM, which you'll also find listed in your program. Please take your seats now. Thank you, and enjoy tonight's program. We'll be st getting started in just a moment. Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is a great pleasure to see so many of you here tonight. My name is Iris Bonnet. I am the academic dean here at the Kennedy School. And it is with great pleasure and honor that I introduce our guest tonight, the Prime Minister of Ireland, Vishak Enda Kenny. Before I continue with the introductions, let me offer some thanks to people who have made this event possible. First, let me thank the Institute of Politics, which as always has been a great organizer and host of this event. And then let me acknowledge um, a special friend to the Kennedy School, Sean Rowland, who is here with us tonight, and his brother, Paul Rowland, great friends um, of Boston, Cambridge, um, and also of the Prime Minister, I might add. And now let me introduce the Taoiseach. And the Kenny was elected a Taoiseach on March 9th, 2011. His personal commitment to public service is very long-standing. He was elected as leader of Fin Gael in June 2002. In the general election in 2011, Fin Gael won 76 seats, becoming the largest party in the lower house in the Irish parliament. Mr. Kenny has represented the people of County Mayo, which is in the west of Ireland, for those of you who've ever had the pleasure of visiting Ireland, and as a Fine Gael member of the lower house since 1975, making him the longest standing member of this body who's currently in service. The Prime Minister has served as a minister in many, many different areas, including in tourism and trade from 1994 to 1907, overseeing great growth in the tourism business, and I know many of us, including I, have been beneficiaries uh, of this beautiful investment in tourism as visitors of Ireland and in Ireland's trade position internationally. As minister, he chaired the European Union Council of Trade Ministers during Ireland's six-month presidency of the European Council. Among the prime ministers, many, many other achievements. Let me just mention two. One was the rejuvenation of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Dublin and successful negotiations to bring a stage of the 1998 Tour de France back to Ireland. As you might imagine, the Prime Minister, in his all too scarce spare time, is an avid cycler. In fact, he often cycles for charitable purposes and he's also climbed Mount Kilimanjaro several times, again, for charitable purposes. It is such a pleasure to have you here with us tonight. And thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to learning from you, Mr. Prime Minister. Iris Bonnet, Ambassador Ladies and gentlemen, 
May I say, first of all, it's a privilege uh, for me to be here at the Kennedy School of Government. I come here today to um, talk to you about reasserting Ireland's place in the world. I do so happily and proudly on behalf of our government, our ancient country and our noble people. In that fateful year of 1963, in his address to the Irish Parliament, President Kennedy asked the old question, how can a nation as small as Ireland play much of a role on the world stage? And then true to form, he answered it. He said, all the world owes much to the little five feet high nations. The greatest art of the world was the work of little nations. The most enduring literature of the world came from little nations. The heroic deeds that thrill humanity through generations were the deeds of little nations fighting for their freedom. Ireland, he said, was that remarkable combination of hope, confidence, and imagination that is needed more than ever today. Two score and ten years on, I'm proud to report that it still is. That visit, that homecoming, lit up the lives of the 1960s in our country. President Kennedy brought a Hollywood glamour to our towns, to our cities, to our country. In Cork City, they said, he was only divine. And looking back at that last Kennedy summer, for so many people, divine seemed just about right in all its interpretations. An Irish man in the White House, just a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis, and here was the leader of the free world, and he came home to Ireland to his own people. So it's a privilege for me to pay a warm tribute to the memory of the late President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and indeed to the Kennedy family, for being steadfast in their love and commitment to the Irish and to Ireland. I thank them for all they've done over the years. Now here at the Kennedy School of Government, you obviously attract some of the world's brightest and best. Our own former President of Ireland and United Nations High Commissioner, Mary Robinson, studied here. Indeed, I understand that your alumni include eight US presidents, 75 Nobel Prize winners, and 62 billionaires. That's just the ones who are still alive. But in keeping with the Kennedy dictum, of those to whom much is given, much is required, every graduate of this school goes on to use his or her skill or expertise and passion for what they do right across the world. This is something that the Irish and Ireland have been doing for centuries. Yes, in recent times we've hit the headlines for reasons we would not have wished. But if that which has been so explicit and so public about Ireland has been negative, let me assure you that it's equally something temporary, something passing. Because today, in reasserting Ireland's place in the world, I want to remind America, and indeed the greater world, of the implicit wealth and value of Ireland and the Irish people. And that's a wealth that can never be accumulated in banks or measured by markets are traded on the stock exchange because it remains intact and alive and sacrosanct in the proud territory of our own people, in the transforming currency of the Irish heart, imagination and soul. Above all, what we call the ushlacht, a Gaelic word for that innate nobility that has sustained us on our Atlantic island for several thousand years, and will for many thousands more. That is the, the ore of our worth. It is that same ore, that same ushlacht, that sent us off across the world as missionaries, teachers, doctors, engineers, politicians, 
and ordinary citizens, to the Congo, to Lebanon, Cyprus, to other conflicts, through UNIFIL, and our commitment to international peace and human rights and security under the UN Charter. That global courage is not recent, nor is it new. Was it not endorsed by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth last year by her recognition of Ireland's contribution in two world wars? In the sixth century, Irish monks set sail from our island to bring what was a semi-barbarian Europe out of the Dark Ages. Our own monk, Columbanus, praised by Pope Benedict as the patron saint of Europe, brought illumination to the Franks and to the Rhineland before building his great monastic settlement, his great European settlement of learning and of faith and culture at Bobbio in Italy. Columbanus and his community spearheaded what was called a Christian Renaissance, a Renaissance that would unite Europe through the discipline, the love, and the hope of Christianity. 1,400 years ago, Ireland colonized the minds of Europe. Therefore, as much or more than any other, it is the Irish sensibility, the Irish implicit, that created and inhabited the beginnings of what would become modern Europe. This is a seminal development in the history of Ireland and the history of Europe. And it's something that we're deeply proud of. Something that must always be remembered, especially at this difficult juncture for our country, for our European Union, and for the world in which we live. In addressing our parliament in 1963, President Kennedy said, the present and the future of Ireland holds so much promise to my nation and indeed to all mankind. And on that late June day, we took him at his word, almost 50 years on, we still do, that innate power and potential of the Irish people is felt closely by the Irish themselves and is recognized worldwide. One only has to look at the level of international goodwill direct towards our country and all its endeavors. Last May, in the space of one week, Queen Elizabeth II and your own President Barack Obama visited Ireland and opened new chapters in these vital relationships of particular importance in these difficult times because towards the end of 2010, Ireland found itself shut out of the financial markets. Inevitably, our country had to turn to the IMF and the European Union for funding. It was indeed a bleak midwinter for our country, our pride, our people. In February of last year, Ireland went to the polls. People spoke. They returned a government comprising of two parties, the party I lead, the Fine Gael Party, and the Labour Party, forming a government with the largest mandate in the history of the Irish state, a mandate to solve Ireland's problems, to steer our country back towards prosperity, to renew our reputation, and to get our people back working again. It's a tough mandate in tough times. And to fulfill that mandate and the wishes of the people, we've had to focus on some key issues. Restoring Ireland's place as a respected and influential member of the international community. Resolving the crisis in our banks and our public finances. Rescuing our economy so that we can get Ireland working to its optimum once more. Just less than a year on, there is evidence that our plan is working and will work. We restructured and recapitalized our banking sector with private investments and deposits now flowing back into the banks. Pursue a solid plan to bring our public finances back into order. Yields in Irish government bonds have more than halved since last July. We've raised revenues without raising income tax. In economics, in politics, and in business, there is less talk of Ireland's difficulties, and more talk of our recovery, and more talk of our opportunity. There is more we want to do, and that needs to be done. 
And I'm not going to pretend to you that it's easy or that we don't face a significant challenge up ahead. The road ahead is long, but we've made a good start. The Irish people, young and old, have shown great resilience and great courage in making sacrifices in order to help us get our public finances on a more stable footing. Their understanding and cooperation is obviously based on government telling them the truth of the scale of what that challenge actually is. And right now we're on target to correct our budget deficit. Steady actions government have taken are sending strong signals to the financial markets about our determination to stick to our plan. It's not easy. But I have made it clear that I want to retrieve Ireland's economic sovereignty and lead a government that will help our country to succeed. I want to make Ireland the best small country in the world in which to do business, in which to raise a family, and indeed in which to grow old with a sense of dignity and respect. And this evening I want to send a message to other countries that Ireland can be a role model for them as they tackle their difficulties. In 2011, growth returned to our country for the first time in several years. That growth is scheduled to continue this year. Competitiveness is improving rapidly. Our exports are at record levels. And sectors where we excel in pharmaceuticals and software and financial services, business services and the agri-food industry are performing particularly well and strongly. It's hardly surprising then that many US multinationals in these sectors have made Ireland their home for many years and the base of their European and wider operations. Last week in New York, President Clinton told corporate America, now is the time to invest in Ireland. He highlighted Ireland's exceptionally young, highly educated, flexible and hard-working population. Ireland is the only English-speaking member of the Eurozone and a gateway to the European market of in excess of 500 million consumers. More than any other country, we have the capacity to be the leaders and the innovators for the future. Irish software was used on the last mission to the space station. It was an Irish drill bit that brought about the effective rescue of the Chilean miners some time ago. And in gaming, in pharma, in cloud technology, in biological sciences, all the next stage intuitive industries, we have the educated young people to fill those jobs, be they homegrown or those that come from inward investment. No other country can match our package of tax, talent, technology, or track record. One of our most important and most cherished relationships is that that exists with the United States of America. Successive US administrations have played a key role in supporting our peace process. Ties of love and loss, of family and friendship, of hope and opportunity bind the American and the Irish people together. We see this in the thriving Irish communities, the length and breadth of this great country. I always say it, ours are the genes that built America. More recently, we've harnessed the huge potential of our diaspora, both in the US and around the world. The Global Irish Network brings together people of Irish heritage from the fields of business, of culture, to politics. Not just those who are Irish by DNA, but Irish by adoption or Irish by simple desire. Many of the 70 million in our Irish diaspora trace their Irish roots back to the great hunger of the 1840s. And famine and hunger still lie deep in the Irish psyche. Our humanitarian values are very much in keeping with those of the international ideas here at the Kennedy School of Government. As President Clinton acknowledged last week, Ireland has a unique and an unbroken record of having people from our country work in developing countries right across the world 
that stretches back to the foundation date of the United Nations. Ireland's Overseas Development Aid Programme, known as Irish Aid, focuses primarily on poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. The primary focus of that programme is to support global efforts to reduce hunger. Indeed, even now, Ireland is still committed to spending one-fifth of its overseas aid budget in support of activities that can improve access to food and reduce malnutrition in the world's poorest countries. And building on our shared experience, Ireland and the US are working in partnership to lead efforts to combat undernutrition across the globe. And today, we jointly lead the 1,000 Days of Action to scale up nutrition for children during this critical period between pregnancy and age two. Ireland will assume the presidency of the European Union on the 1st of January 2013, next year, 40 years after our succession to the common market, and 1,400 years since Irish monks like Gaul and Columbanus rescued Europe and brought the light of Christianity to a dark continent. And yet from our small island in the Atlantic, Ireland affected the kind of change that saw the father of Europe, Charlemagne, his court with Irish scholars and with Irish thinkers. The kind of change from which modern Europe was born. Now, the Irish presidency of the European Union will come at a critical and challenging time for Ireland and for the European Union as a whole. But equally, it presents our country with an invaluable opportunity to prove why we still belong at the heart of the decision-making process of Europe. In our presidency, we will embrace the concerns of the people of Europe, boosting Europe's competitiveness, restoring strong and sustainable economic growth, creating all important jobs, and just as critically, we will work to win the hearts and the minds of Europe with a new sense of urgency. Recommitting ourselves as to the why of Europe, to the ideal and the possibility of a compassionate and dynamic Europe, which was imagined by Monet and by Schumann and by de Gasperi. The economic and financial crisis which has gripped Europe is unparalleled and unprecedented in the history of our Union. At first, Europe was very slow to respond. The lack of trust in the actions of leaders was palpable. So many conditions conspired to create that cliché, the perfect storm. The global crisis that led to a credit crunch, the banking crisis that followed, the sovereign debt crisis linked to the banking and liquidity crisis, Equally, there were European ec economies that required serious structural reform. And when that storm broke, we found that Europe did not have the capacity to act quickly enough or decisively enough to stabilize the currency. A dangerous and persistent crisis of confidence in Europe and the euro ensued. I believe, however, that we're now reaching a point where we can move beyond that crisis and get Europe back on track to growth and recovery so important for the United States and so important in a global sense. Trust is slowly being re-established. Europe has shown the world that we are serious about protecting our currency. A strong, stable, single currency area remains a fundamental pillar of Europe's long-term economic growth and job strategy. We've strengthened our budgetary rules and our ability to enforce discipline. Just two weeks ago, we agreed a new treaty text to further strengthen, in a verifiable manager, ma manner, budgetary discipline and coordination within the euro area. More binding and enforceable fiscal rules are good both for Ireland and the eurozone. Of course, that's only part of the solution. New fiscal rules will only restore confidence if they go hand in hand with greater efforts to support growth. We need to do more to generate that growth and that confidence. We need bigger financial firewalls to protect countries pursuing sound economic policies. 
Because when that crisis broke, those firewalls did not exist. It took some time to realize that. Initially, they were restrictive in their application. Recently, though, they've become somewhat more flexible, and that flexibility is welcome. We also welcome the willingness to consider increasing the size and scale of those firewalls. And the European Central Bank, an independent body, is now making increasingly creative and innovative use of its remit as it adapts to the crisis. And Ireland remains hopeful that, like the US Federal Reserve, as new credible fiscal rules for Euro countries are agreed, that the ECB will be able to play a more comprehensive role in combating the financial crisis. So slowly and surely, the prospects of stability and recovery are emerging. Stricter, more coordinated budgetary discipline among the member states, implemented alongside ample and flexible firewalls, should provide room for confidence to develop again. And crucially, crucially, we have now placed growth and job creation back at the central focus of the European agenda, exploiting in full the EU's potential as the largest trading bloc in the world. I've argued for this since, as Taoiseach, I first attended a meeting of the European heads of government at European Council level. There is now, I believe, a shared understanding that discipline and austerity, necessary though they are, will only take us so far. Vital recovery depends upon vital growth. And with that growth will come the much needed jobs for our people and for our economy. This is a time for real political leadership and real political courage. For governments that work in partnership and in cooperation with the people on implementing a clear plan to achieve our objectives, to bring clarity and definition so that people and business can plan their futures and their lives up ahead. So, today in Europe and in Ireland, we stand, as one greater than I observed, on the edge of a new frontier, a frontier of hope and opportunity. What's new can be frightening, but equally, it can be quite exhilarating. Now, Ireland and Europe must leap together into the new, into the next stage of the European process. Tomorrow, I hope to visit the Kennedy Library, the exhibits, the documents, the photographs of history lived, history made, and ultimately, left unfinished. Every time it gives me that strange sense of melancholy and fortitude. John F. Kennedy has been and is a haunting presence in our lives. The ringing clarity of his voice calls into sharp focus the scale of potential lost. Even now, whenever I see President Clinton for that split second I imagine him as the young man who once stood in the Rose Garden to meet the young president. The torch was passed. And today, as Ireland begins to reassert itself in the world, let me say that our torch, our light, burns brighter and purer and stronger than ever. Let me say that our best and brightest days are still and always will be up ahead. For a people and a country, as they say, ever agent, ever new. Thank you. Taoiseach has agreed to answer a few questions. There are five, four microphones um, in different places here at the Kennedy School. If you would like to ask a question, please do introduce yourselves with your name and affiliation, and do ask one question per person. And those of you who have been at the Kennedy School before know that uh, we feel quite strongly about a question ending with a question mark. 
with that, let me move right over there. Thank you. Um, my name is um, Jennifer Sheehy Skeffington. I'm a, a third year PhD student in uh, Harvard and I'm from Dublin. Um, I just wanted to commend um, your inspiring speech and also your focus on equity and the principles of equity that your government has brought to Ireland. That's also something that characterizes um, healthcare reform uh, and the program for healthcare reform. And I just wanted to offer a perspective as a student in the States on that and then, and then to ask you a question about it. Um, so I in the States, the principles of equity were guiding um, President Obama's healthcare reform. And, but many of my American friends sense that it didn't go far enough, as in that what we were left with is an individual mandate where insurance companies were paying uh, sorry, where insurance companies were providing the coverage as opposed to a single payer system where the government provides it. And my friends cannot believe when I tell them that our program for equity actually intends to move from what's effectively a single payer system to an individual mandate system where universal health insurance is not provided by the government but by health insurance companies with all of the problems about costing and profits and actually higher uh, costs that, that has resulted on in the US. So I'm just wondering if you could offer any reassurance for people in my family who are doctors and who are very worried about the implications of that for the ethos of our healthcare system. Yes. Okay, do you want me to take them individually? Yeah, well, in Ireland we have a two-tier health system, uh, public and private. It hasn't worked the way it should. We intend to move to a, to a model of, um, of universal health insurance at the end of our program for government where every person will be treated on the same basis uh, based on the requirement of their medical need as a thing from, from what they've got in their pocket, which will mean that each individual person will be entitled to go to their GP, the doctor of their choice, in respect of the program of health uh, that they require and that's most suited to their needs. Uh, we've, had a, uh, we've had a system of health in Ireland which has grown up over the years in a very haphazard fashion, if you like, um, and it hasn't delivered for what we, for what we, what we need. So our focus really is to um, start with the process of very strong primary care centres uh, where doctors come together with other uh, medical staff that can deal in the main with, um, with um, difficulties that people have without having to require them to go to accident and emergency units for every little issue. Secondly, to have a very strong community care system where people can actually be cared for in their own homes for as long as is possible. We've had a... We've had a We've had many instances of, um, of people who've been assessed for geriatric care, who've actually been, uh, who've actually been sent to uh, long-stay institutions uh, for many years before they actually needed to be there, uh, without having many people being asked where they'd like to be themselves. So we're, we're in the process of, of developing that concept. And at the end, towards the closing period of this uh, government's remit, we move to a point where an introduction of universal health insurance will apply. It's different than that in the United States, because ours will be based by insurance companies across the board, but the requirement will be that the bridge uh, relates to the medical need of the uh, patient as distinct from uh, the source of income or the extent of income that they have. We move right up there. Hi, my name is Holly Flynn. I'm a freshman in the college, and my question is on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee at the IOP. So many people are concerned about the preservation of the Irish language, and it seems that state-sponsored schools aren't helping students achieve proficiency, and there's been a decline in native speakers. So is a plan for revitalization needed? And if so, what would that look like? Well, I think it's a good thing to say that it's a good thing to say that it's a good thing That's just a little sample of what the Gaelic tongue is like. Um, in our country, um, the Irish language, the Gaelic tongue, is a very old language. It came originally from the Rhineland, related to the, um, to the uh, P Celtic and Q Celtic languages of Scotland and Wales. Um, obviously, in the last 200 years, there's been, uh, been reasons why the language declined and why uh, people, people uh, emigrated because of economic circumstances and therefore its impact was lost. I'd say to you, however, that the concept of learning languages today is very much easier and much more sophisticated than used to apply. As I speak here um, in, the, in, in, in this school, we have areas in our country where the Gaelic tongue is still the native uh, language. But I'd also say to you that uh, there are probably more people in the country now who can speak Irish uh, than for very many years. Uh, oftentimes it's a source of uh, you have to encourage people to use the, uh, 
uh, the uh, elements of the language that they have and to feel comfortable using that. We always had a difficulty in Ireland in that what you might call pure native speakers uh, would find that persons making an attempt to speak the language might have been looked down on to an extent by their incompetence in not being able to speak it fluently. Now that's gone. So through the school system and through the, through the modern methods of teaching languages, uh, which, are the, which are involved with the use of technology and practice, actually there are more people who understand Irish uh, now than for very, very many years, like through the local radio stations, through the national broadcaster and so on. Um, so we'd like to think that what we can develop is a very strong bilingual country, that people are proud of their language, that they understand its origins and its source and its, uh, its importance, its music and its culture and its tradition. Um, but the original intention of having the entire country uh, Gaelicized, that it would only be the Irish language, is no, longer, is no longer an issue. But it is important that we say to our younger generation uh, th there's an importance attached here in the sense of its value to them as, as people, as citizens, to their personality and the personality of our country. Um, and the school structure uh, it focuses on that. So in respect of the, um, the areas that are still Gaelic speaking, uh, a new bill will define more accurately what those areas are. Uh, and work of government will continue to support industry and opportunities in the areas where young boys and young girls and the people speak Irish as their, as, their, um, as their everyday language. It's not as prevalent as it used to be because all of those people, by and large, uh, speak English fluently as well. Kate Mila Falcha. Uh, my name is Danny Hatham, and I am a uh, second year student here, or first year student here at the Kennedy School. And uh, my question is uh, about your, your speech. Uh, you spoke about the mandate that was given to Fine Gael in the la and, and Labour in the last election. And my qu question is that if you are so secure in your political position, and you are because you've taken these many bold moves, why not permit the Irish people an up or down vote on the uh, Fiscal Union Treaty? Um. In our country, you can only change your constitution um, by vote of the people. Our constitution, which we call Bunracht na Heron in Irish, requires um, that if you change a comma or a word or a sentence in that or an article, you must ask the people to do so. But you don't change your constitution for no reason. Uh, and in this case of the, of the fiscal compact, which has had an agreed text now from 25 countries out of 27. Uh, the process is that you uh, negotiate with the other countries about what's important in the context of your country as these discussions take place. At the conclusion of that, when uh, a text is agreed, the process in Ireland is that the government of the day asks the Attorney General of the day for formal legal advice as to whether the elements of the agreed text comply with the constitutionality of our constitution. In other words, the question that is asked of the Attorney General is, is it necessary to have a referendum or not? That's always been the process. Now, when we concluded this business at the last uh, Euro European Council meeting and agreed on the text, the following day at Cabinet, we referred the, um, we referred the, the agreed text to the Attorney General seeking formal legal advice. She now will deliberate on that and is deliberating on it. And when her conclusions are reached, she'll make them known to government. That means that if she says, uh, on the basis of formal legal advice, that a referendum is necessary, a referendum will be held. If she says that it's not necessary to hold a referendum, then a referendum will not be held. That doesn't mean that when you, uh, when you put together a bill, a, a legislative bill, to give effect to the treaty, that it wouldn't be challenged in the courts. Uh, that's an issue that obviously is open and was open in the past to uh, citizens to contest. So you don't, you know, willy-nilly say we're going to have a referendum on this or a referendum on that. It's not the same as, as let's say, in the cantons in, in Switzerland where you might decide to have a referendum on, on, uh, on a lot of local issues. Ours is a, is a legally binding constitutional document and you don't change it lightly. Sir. Hi, sir. My name is Zachary Hodges. I'm a freshman uh, at the college here, um, 
And my question is basically, uh, during while listening to your speech, um, you mentioned a lot on the pride within Ireland, um, instilling the pride uh, kind of throughout the people and the tourism um, within your own country, um, something that in effect seems to be dwindling here within my country. Um, uh, one of my freshman courses, um, global, the economic globalization, um, kind of also spoke under Larry Summers, also spoke about kind of how the pride within a country uh, reflects uh, in, in our globalizing markets. And I kind of wanted to know what, what your thoughts or takes, take was on how your, your, this pride that you seem to want to, or your country seems to instill in itself through the language and other forms, um, and how you take that on as far as globalizing and mm -hmm. working within a global market or global community. Thank you, Danny. Um, for, for, um, for a number of centuries, Irish people, because of economic circumstances, were forced to emigrate. That means that we understand deep in our DNA what it is to be a stranger in another country, whether it be in the United States or whether it be in Australia or Great Britain. I made this point um, last year in the White House, speaking in the, um, at the occasion of, of meeting President Obama, that the, um, the waters that divided our countries, Ireland and Africa, brought the African people to America to slavery and the Irish people to America to freedom. And yet, uh, as the world moves on, we have learned to be very pragmatic about the challenges that we face. And we know that because of a variety of um, happenings, a large gap exists in our public finances. In other words, you're spending 18 billion more than you're taking in. No business can be run like that. Our people understand this is very challenging, that this will not fix itself. Nobody's going to walk in as a check for all of that. And the only people who can deal with that, um, with that debt are our, ourselves alone. But it means that government actually have to work in cooperation with people. It's not a case of government saying to people, this now is what you do. You have to understand that there are challenges and serious pressure and stress on a range of sectors across the board. And it's very important that government level with people insofar as the truth of the scale of the challenge is concerned. Irish people in that sense are very pragmatic. They will say, you tell me how deep this is, tell me how serious the problem is, and I'll help you. But don't tell me that it's all sorted out and that everything is rosy in the garden when my son is in Australia, my two daughters are in America, my other son's in, in Great Britain, and we can't get employment. So in recognizing the scale of that challenge, people have been very patient, have been very cooperative, have been very understanding, by and large, of course, you'll have protests uh, legitimately here and there. Uh, this happens everywhere. We do understand that our country wants to be a central part of the process of the European Union, to play our part, to pay our way, to grow our economy, because politics for me, first and last, is about people. A job can transform a life. Government doesn't create jobs, but by its decisions, it can create the atmosphere and the environment where business can actually flourish, where jobs can happen, where employment can take place, and where people can um, contribute to their local economies and to their country as a consequence. Last year, I happened to meet one of my, um, one of my boyhood idols in um, the great Muhammad Ali. He used to say, you know, it's never the mountain that's going to stop you, it's the pebble in your shoe. So the job of government, in a myriad of ways, is to remove those pebbles and let people play their part, give vent to their creativity, their imagination, their productivity, their willingness to contribute and make our country great. That's my job. Hi, Tishik. My name is Noreen Bowden. I'm a mid-career MPA here. Um, I just mo I moved to Boston after 15 years in Ireland, uh, and I run a website called globalirish.ie. 
and thank you for your speech. I'm wondering, um, when do you think Ireland is going to join the rest of Europe and most developed countries in allowing its emigrants the right to vote? And also, how do you plan to fulfill your promise to experiment with um, embassy voting in presidential elections? Well, oh, ask your first question again, uh, Noreen, please. Uh, when do you think Ireland is going to join most of the nations of Europe and the rest of the developed world in allowing its emigrants the right to vote yeah. back home from abroad? Well, I suppose, first of all, uh, Irish people understand very well their politics because it's a small island. Elections are fought on a very intense basis. Uh, we have a situation where everybody in the country has access to the politicians. I walk to work in the morning and walk home in the evening and meet the taxi men on the street or the busmen or whoever else. Um, people feel very, uh, very enabled to go and talk to their their prime minister, or their ministers, or their public representatives, irrespective of party or, or not, to, who, to which they're elected. It's important to bear in mind that if Ireland was to allow everybody to vote who claims to be Irish, we have 35 million Irish Americans, um, 70 million worldwide, you certainly have government after government elected by people who don't live in the country and therefore wouldn't be paying their... Yeah. Well, um, obviously, it depends on how far back you want to go, because you can have you know, passports legitimately issued to um, Irish people who um, go back two or three generations, 400,000 in Argentina who would claim to be of Irish descent, significant numbers in Chile, one third of the Australian population, a million in Britain. So there's always the question of, uh, you know, do you, do you let people vote in, in a general election or a presidential election uh, who aren't actually taxpayers in the country? It's an issue. Now, one of the commitments gave in the programme for government was to uh, form a constitutional convention of uh, people in politics, of ordinary citizens, who would look at a range of issues that they would consider and deliberate and make recommendations uh, for government to actually consider. One of those would be in regard to the, the uh, presidential period of service, which in Ireland is seven years. Um, if that were to be reduced to five, for instance, it would tie with the statutory requirements for local elections, which are five years, and the European elections, which are five years, and happen on the same dates as defined. Um, so there's nothing technically to stop something like this happening, but it's a matter that would, um, would require some, some, I think, very comprehensive discussions. Um, we've had, um, we've had you know, uh, observations over about this for years, in fact, governments in the past uh, made recommendations, as did all party parliamentary committees, uh, but it, never, uh, it was never brought to fruition. We did suggest that in the, um, in the upper house, of the, which is the Senate, that people should be entitled to represent the diaspora abroad, uh, but then you run into all kinds of flack. If you have to travel from Australia every fortnight, if you were elected to do that, it might cause trouble as well. It could be on the front pages for different reasons in airline tickets and everything else. So it's an issue that will be discussed, I would uh, assume, in due course by the Oireachtas itself uh, and to a, an extent by the Constitutional Convention when it's set up. Hmm? We have five more minutes and time for two more questions. We'll take one over there and then one here, right here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zach Rosenfeld. I'm an MPP1 here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, I just wanted to ask, because you s spoke at some length about fiscal policy, but I wanted to ask you a little bit more about monetary policy. Uh, the ECB has really kept interest rates low, as well as the required reserve ratio, but they've been setting very low inflation targets, um, keeping the, the value of the euro currency quite high. And this is, um, at least in my opinion, quite damaging to uh, sort of growing export economies like Ireland and like Spain. So do you think the ECB could be doing more to uh, allow for growth in your country? And uh, how would you, uh, as a rising uh, president of the, of, the, of the European Union, how would you influence them to do that? Well, the, 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 the fundamental responsibility of the ECB is to control inflation. Uh, the ECB is an independent body and it's made up of governors of the uh, 17 governors of the central banks of the countries that are part of the Eurozone. Uh, the question is, um, uh, in the same way as the Federal Reserve operates here, what should be the role and the remit of the ECB for the future? Um, people have a very strong view in some countries that the European Central Bank should be the last, uh, the last backstop in respect of uh, liquidity and um, uh, availability of finance for banks. 
Uh, but because of, the, of its independence at the moment, and because of the way the, uh, the Eurozone has set about dealing with its fiscal responsibilities, um, Mr. Draghi, who is the, um, who is the new president of the bank, has taken a different view than his predecessor, Mr. Trichet. He has actually made available unlimited amounts of money for European banks at low interest. He hasn't gone so far as to say that the, uh, that the um, um, European Central Bank should deal with debt through a system of euro bonds, uh, or whether the, um, whether the facilities uh, of the um, European Stability Mechanism, the ESM and the EFSF, would be acquired by the ECB in due course. Probably, to be honest with you, when the, um, when the uh, fiscal compact on the new treaty is ratified by the different countries, it may well be that the European Central Bank um, will, will expand its remit or be more comprehensive. I think that people uh, throughout Europe in many governments would like to see that happen, that you would have a, a European Central Bank uh, that would operate on the basis of what Europe's problems actually are. In the meantime, it's open to um, European countries to look at the question of the potential of the single market. That means, for instance, if you devised, um, uh, you, you got a patent for, for something that you develop in Scotland, that it should apply uh, right across the European zone. It does in theory, but the cost is of the order of 32 to 40,000 euro. Here in the United States, it's maybe 1,800 or 2,000 dollars. Uh, so we need to free up the potential of that market with 500 million people um, as consumers. And on the fringes of the European Union, you have another five to 600, um, five to 600 um, million people uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a second market, if you like. In fact, the point made at the forum organized by President Clinton last week in New York was that you know, six out of the top ten countries in, from a growth perspective are now in Africa, and that this is an issue that needs to be looked at in terms of Europe's capacity to service that market and to trade in a very strong fashion. So ECB's remit is control inflation. Given the financial turmoil we've had for the last period, its role in the future may change, but it won't change until ratification takes place of the, of the new treaty, the, the text of which has been agreed. My Sorry. name's Adam Kelly. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the English department here. Uh, I'd like to start b just by comm commending you in your speech, and particularly um, your wish to regain economic sovereignty for Ireland. Um, but one of the one of the ways in which we've had to go about doing that is, as you know, to to invite the, EMF, the IMF, the ECB, and the EU into the country, the so-called Troika, and uh, they've laid down a, a number of conditions. And as we've seen in the, new, in the newspapers this week, one of those conditions has been that Ireland must sell a large proportion of our state assets. Now, the way that's been reported in the newspaper this week has, is, is that it, it, we, we, it's terrific that we're, we're allowed to put a little bit of that money back into job creation. But really, my question is simply, by the time we get economic sovereignty back, uh, it seems that we're not going to have a lot of infrastructural um, ownership left over um, things that we can be sovereign over. So I, I'm wondering what your positive spin on, on, on this kind of privatization model is for Irish citizens. Very positive. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, in a, we're in a program, as they call it. It's nothing fancy, believe you me. It means that um, countries uh, has lost its economic sovereignty. We can't fly on our own independently. It means, in reality, that if I attend a cabinet meeting next Tuesday, and we agree at cabinet level to do X number of projects, the troika in the corner will say, sorry, do that, because I'm, I have to pay. So we have to sit down on a quarterly basis with the troika. They go through a detailed forensic analysis of the way government has behaved in the previous three months in order to validate uh, continued payment for the period ahead. It doesn't mean, of course, that uh, the government can't renegotiate elements of the original memorandum of understanding with the Troika. We have and we do. One of the issues that was um, part of the requirement of the Troika was that there should be uh, a substantial amount of state assets actually sold. The programme for government, of which my party and the Labour Party agreed, was that we would realise two billion worth of sale of state assets over the period of government. What that means is that the government would decide uh, on the possibility of selling state assets up to two billion. These state assets would be non-strategic 
um, and would be decided not on a fire, not on a you know um, a, a, a fire sale, but would be disposed of at an appropriate uh, at an appropriate time uh, in the best interests of the people. The uh, discussions that took place in originally were that any money that was accrued from um, the sale of state assets should go towards debt reduction. Now, following some further discussions and intensive talks with the Troika. They've agreed now that a substantive amount of, um, of anything realised from the sale of state assets could be used for job creation in a range of fields, utilities, energy, water or whatever. Um, so government set up an entity under the National Treasury Management Agency called the New Era, which in the event, let's say, of the government deciding to sell forestries, let's say, the trees as distinct from the land, um, that the new era entity would value that and government would decide in its own time how, how that should be disposed of. There isn't any pressure on the government in terms of time or in terms of a requirement to have a fire sale by the Troika. But clearly there are areas in the energy market where you require competition, um, where there would be serious interest in, in the development of that in Ireland. But we wouldn't be selling transmission systems transmission lines or transmission pipes because they would be re regarded as strategic assets. So if it was, let's say, energy generation would be an issue uh, where you could have competition in the market which would be good for the consumer. Um, so I think that given where we are, there are non-strategic assets that can be sold that will be considered for disposal uh, and the government in its own time will make its decisions as to how best that should actually happen. The advantage would be that um, you still retain your strategic assets, but that you can use a substantial amount of the monies accrued from the sales for direct job creation. See, we have a very strong line of investment into the country. Our exports are flying, double digits in lots of cases, in stuff that's not cyclical, or that's not subject to cyclical um, you know, pressures, like the pharma area, the IT area, the agri-sector, food, all these things. So. In that sense, what we have to develop uh, is the challenge of stimulating our own indigenous economy. Saving ratios in Ireland are very high, up to 15%. Some people have a lot of money left aside. They haven't been spending it because they've been unclear where the future actually lies, which I was referring to in terms of being able to plan their own careers. So government is focusing on you know, improving the atmosphere and the environment where business can actually flourish. What does that mean? We were able to reduce VAT in the hospitality sector from 13.5% to 9%, give those people an opportunity to continue on. Have the PRSI for employers for lower paid workers, make it easier to hold on to employees and take on new people. But also by taxation measures and others in the budget and the finance bill to say to small business, look, you, you show me where, you're, where the pebble is in your shoe. Show me where the red tape should go. Show me the kind of help that you need, whether it's access to credit from banks, whether it's microfinance that you need, whether it's mentoring, whether it's assistance in changing direction, that's where Ireland's future is in, you know, in paralleling what's happening with the investment from abroad in having a really strong basis for innovation, for research, for a development of issues that we can export. Because the more you export and the more it's bought, the more we sell, the more you generate for the country. I make the point here that between the 1990 and 2000, while our, debt, uh, while our debt increased, the debt to GDP ratio went down, not because of austerity programs, but because of growth in the economy. And that's where the future lies for us. that, let me thank the Thishak for his very insightful remarks and for speaking to both our hearts and our minds and reminding us of the pebble in our shoes if ever we see these big mountains ahead of us and for the leadership you provide in Ireland and in Europe. Thank you very much. I would like to ask you to please remain seated until the Prime Minister has left. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.